All right, good morning. Thank you for waking up uh, early on a Saturday for caring about public safety. Um, my name is Josh Corman. I don't think I have a, a title slide, but I'm one of the founders of uh, IamTheCavalry.org, and, and I might touch on what that is a little bit, but mostly I'm going to talk about uh, one year ago here on our first birthday, uh, we launched a five-star automotive cyber safety framework. We basically said to the auto industry through a, an open letter in the mainstream press, we said, look, you're masters of your domain, we're masters of our domain, and now that our domains have collided with computers on wheels, we're going to have safer outcomes sooner if we work together. Um, it was a bit controversial at the time because uh, our friends thought cars would never be hacked or even if they could, no one would do it. And now you fast forward one year and there's been quite a lot more activity on that front. But our basic belief was that um, if we leave them to their own devices, they're going to either make the same mistakes we've made for 15, 20 years in enterprise security. Um, but the difference is the consequences of failure are so much higher, right? It's life and limb, it's your family, it's flesh and blood. So anyhow, over the course of the last year, we've been aggressively trying to work across the automotive industry as more of a helping hand than a pointing finger. Uh, and I'll give you an update of what's worked, what hasn't, where we're stuck, and maybe how you could help. But the last two weeks alone have had pretty massive breakthroughs, good and bad, uh, in how this is all playing out. <clears throat> Um, so it kind of started two years ago with Charlie and Chris. Now they are not the first to hack. Um, sorry for the elite speak on unsafe at any speed uh, and apologies to Ralph Nader. But uh, as many of you saw, they had Andy Greenberg who, had, who was at Forbes at the time uh, driving uh, a car. They did this to a Toyota Prius into a Ford vehicle. And they essentially showed that while connected to the, the dashboard directly to the CAN bus, they were able to manipulate the things that the CAN bus can be manipulated. And it was a real wake-up call for several people, including um, a senator, Senator Markey in Massachusetts, who was like, I don't like this. What's going on here? So it scared quite a few people. And yes, they wore track suits and did it for a little bit of glory and ego. But it did capture imagination and attention. And it started a lot more people looking into car hacking. Um, now, the kind of things they could do, hopefully you guys know at this point, but they could uh, lie about the speed on the odometer. They could tug on the seat belts. They could... Um, disable the brakes, which scared the bejesus out of the driver. Luckily, it was in a parking lot at the time. But the one that really bothered me is because some of these have parking assist functionality and have a, motor, a very strong motor that can control the steering wheel, um, they could trick the car into thinking it was going zero miles an hour and was doing the, park, the parallel parking, and they could jerk the steering wheel out of the driver's hands, and it's much stronger uh, than you'd be able to resist. So one of the things I try to tell, what you're about to see is what I tell Detroit or what I tell the auto industry. And since we launched this, uh, Bo Woods, myself, Craig Smith, we had about a call a day for the first 45 days after DEF CON last year. And it was pretty much everybody. It was the people who make the tech packages for automobile makers. It was automakers themselves. It was automotive dealers. It was trial lawyers, insurers, regulators, DHS. So pretty much anyone with a stake in car hacking or in the automotive industry wanted to know more. And at first, they kind of hated us and thought we were going to blackmail them and drop O'Day on them because Charlie and Chris are fairly hated by large chunks of the automotive industry, despite what they tell you. Uh, they might have one or two people in the security team who are really happy to see the external pressure. But what they're doing as well, and this is one of the reasons we have to have a, you know, plural voices, is they're also scaring people and they're scaring the legal teams and the PR teams to be polarized against the research community. But... We had to find ways to fuzz the chain of influence and figure out how to make them uh, engage. So this was a presentation right around April, a couple chunks, where I, I finally found our stride and we finally got them to realize that we're here to help. One of the things we said is all systems fail, right? Um, yes, all systems fail. So we had to ask the room, is there anybody in here that thinks a car won't be hacked? Is there anybody left here? And one of the things I like to put this, because you have a whole bunch of engineers, physical engineers and systems engineers in the room, is that there's a certain number of defects per thousand lines of code, no matter who's writing them. Right? There's a range of defects. And when you look at a modern vehicle, there's over 100 million lines of code in modern vehicles. Some of them are much worse. So you know there's bugs in there, and you know it takes one. Right? And the presence of a defect doesn't mean it's exploitable, but clearly there's gold in there, so those hills, right? But that's not really what the issue was, because a lot of them knew that, and they've had software in cars for a very, very long time. What they weren't paying attention to, because they were trying to believe their own um, story, 
is that the number of remote attack surfaces was exploding. So the vulnerability being there wasn't the issue if, if you had to plug into a dashboard. And for a long, long time, their attitude was, well, if you have physical access to the car, you know, that's not really hacking. You could slash the tires or cut the brake lines. There's all sorts of things you can do. And this prevented them from being motivated to do something about it. Now, but what they weren't paying attention to is in parallel, they were adding 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspots standard to all Chevy vehicles, for example. But you have Bluetooth, near field, radio, you have the tire pressure monitors, which were mandated by California so that you could have fuel economy with having full tires. You have the app store, which could be malicious third-party apps, and raise your hand if you don't think you can pop malicious third-party apps through an app store. Um, and then you, other sorts of attack surfaces. And even a less hackable car is proving to be hackable because you have these OBD2 dongles um, from Progressive, from your insurance company, who if they have a vulnerability, they are now the stepping stone onto the wide open uh, car network. So that's really what's changed. It's not so much that they've been vulnerable, although they are increasing in their complexity and attack surface, but that the remote access to them is what's going up through the roof. And the app stores, uh, for example. And this doesn't even touch on the vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure protocols, which we will touch on. So ultimately, when you actually push them, they say, well, yeah, but Josh, no one would hurt you, right? There's no money in it, which is A, is a stunning lack of imagination because I can think of several ways to make money off of car hacking. But even if you think about that, we don't just have one type of adversary, right? If you've ever done a threat model before, the first adversary is Murphy, right? It's accidents and adversaries and just plain old straight up glitches could have consequences for life and limb, right? I've never seen a, you know, how often do you have to reboot your laptop? But I'm actually much more concerned about different types of adversaries, right? It could be script kitties. I don't think they're going to try to hurt you, but they could accidentally hurt you. You could brick a bunch of systems. Uh, Russian business network is a traditional one for enterprise security, but if people forget, Putin jammed a bunch of cyber systems be as he drove tanks into Georgia. So this is a form of asserting will or disabling vehicles or emergency response. Um, there's the entire nation of Brazil has a sole source vendor who has vulnerable remote kill switches in all their emergency response vehicles. So cop cars, ambulances, fire trucks, shipping containers. If you wanted to disable the city, if you wanted to cause panic, you could do so en masse. And that's not just Brazil. But that feature once added has now made its way into nearly every make and model. So you have to think of every motivation in the human condition, and it could be someone like Jeremy uh, Hammond from Mulsac, who is much more aggressive and anti-law enforcement. It could be someone like a nation state. It could be political campaigns, but there's every motivation in the human condition. And what I like to remind people is, where was the money in the Charlie Hebdo attacks? There wasn't any. Where was the money in the Boston Marathon bombers? Or what motivated the kid to shoot up his school in Sandy Hook, Connecticut? So. I don't want to have to depend on the kindness of every human being on earth, and as Dan Gear likes to say on the internet, every sociopath is your next door neighbor. So I just don't like the dependence we're doing where we went from a, a period where they couldn't hurt me to now where one I'm hoping they wouldn't hurt me. Now one of the things that got their attention though is they don't want to be regulated. So um, one of the responses to Charlie and Chris's research is letters went out from Senator Markey in Massachusetts and Senator Blumenthal in Connecticut and they basically said we want you to answer these survey questions about your readiness for hacking and tracking. They were concerned about safety and privacy. And after a year of um, aggregating these and doing analysis on it, they put out um, a blog post and a report called Hacking and Tracking. And in it, they kind of hinted that they might be doing a cyber bill on cars. <clears throat> and they hinted they were doing three things for privacy and three things for security. And a lot of the, the hackers kind of made fun of some of their points, but there was some good instinct in there. But what this did is it changed the tone of the automakers to stop ignoring Charlie and Chris or stop ignoring the Cavalry's efforts or stop ignoring Craig Smith's open garages and say, wait a second, if we don't get our act together, they might regulate us and we'll have to spend years undoing bad regulation. The other thing that happened almost the exact same time is there was a, a class action lawsuit after the 60 Minutes piece where DARPA showed they could hack a particular vehicle. In fact, in that one week period in February, you had the 60 Minutes piece which told the general public that cars could be hacked. You had the Senator Markey report come out. You had um, the BMW vehicle compromised, if you remember the hack in February. Um, and you had uh, Craig Smith and I working with NBC New York. We showed that the NBC reporter could hack um, a vehicle in Seattle from 3,000 miles away on, on the news. So that was a really nice concentrated amount of, okay, maybe we have to stop ignoring this. 
<clears throat> so what we had published one year ago, the formal names are, we basically said, look, you have five star crash writing systems, let's have some sort of way to instead of just tell you you screwed up on this one feature, on this one make and model. Uh, Nick and myself and the other Calvary folks, we said we have no interest in finding and fixing one flaw in one device on one make and model from one vehicle. We want to make the whole industry safer. And to do so, you need some sort of common ground and some minimum denominator. And no one wants to create the PCI standard for cars, right? Uh, in fact, I think I skipped that, but I probably shouldn't. But yeah, let me let me take a second to say this here. So we hate hackers. Obviously, are, are a bit allergic to formal rules and government regulation, right? Now we don't have a political ideology, but in general, there's very low confidence the government will figure this out. And I completely appreciate that perspective. We know they're going to be acting. So what we wanted to do was make sure that we help them act in a more intelligent way. And I spent a few years personally fighting the PCI Council for credit cards because I, I actually call it the No Child Left Behind Act for Information Security because it was actually making customers weaker. It was making enterprises do really old, ineffective things instead of doing really good things because they spent all their time and money on the wrong stuff. So we knew left to their own devices, we're going to have a PCI for cars. And I just want you to think about this for a second. We spend about $80 billion a year protecting credit cards. About $80 billion. And it's an abject failure. Nearly every retailer has had a compromise of their credit cards. It's an abject failure. The only reason it's acceptable is because the banks, as long as they only have a 4% fraud rate in total payout, it's still okay. So the standard doesn't prevent breaches. It just makes sure that the damage in financial terms is acceptable and they keep it within that 4% range. So I've got to ask you, is if, if we even replicate the $80 billion of spend and the 140 security categories that we bolt on to payment card systems, is a 4% additional attack surface and failure rate acceptable for cars? Is a 1% acceptable for cars? So not only do we have to be as good as enterprise security, we need to be significantly better. And that's why I knew if we didn't try to articulate this to insurers, to regulators, to automakers, they're going to come up with a PCI for cars. And it's going to be, you need a firewall and an IDS and an antivirus and all this terrible stuff, right? And there's going to be a role for bolt-on security, and there always will be. But we wanted them to take this more seriously and have built-in defensible architectures so we actually have a fighting chance. So what we basically said is you need five postures towards failure. Tell your customers publicly how you do safety by design. How do you seek to protect them from any risk incurred by their computer on wheels? The second one's really key for this room, which is do you have third-party collaborations? Do you have a public attestation of your, um, that you will not sue third-party researchers acting in good faith following your process, which is a huge deal for getting us over the hump here. And I'll, I'll get in that a little bit more. Do you have evidence capture? Do you, ha you cannot decry that you have no evidence of hacking when none of these vehicles have any evidence capture to prove otherwise. It's completely circular. In fact, right when we presented this last year, somebody came up to me and said, I know Michael Hastings was assassinated. You know, you guys need to take this up the hill. And I said, that kind of talk is going to get you nowhere. But what I can tell you is if we can get something like this into place, there will always be fingerprints and evidence if someone does try to hurt people in their cars. And we can learn from it. Number four, uh, security updates. So you can't have a hackable, vulnerable uh, remote interface on a vehicle and no way to actually fix it. And I'm not sure if you're comfortable with sending USB dongles out through the mail and hoping people apply them correctly, but that doesn't feel very robust to me. If when I was talking to people in the auto industry, optional recalls have sometimes less than 10% adoption. So everyone's celebrating that this thing got patched. No, this thing got a patch available. This thing isn't patched until it's patched. If you contrast this with BMW, they were able to over the air update every single one of their customers before their customers even knew they were vulnerable. And I'm not saying BMW is awesome, but the, the, the distinct advantages of comprehensive and quick uh, response time is a key that's going to be necessary for cars because we're going to get hacked often. And then segmentation and isolation. So we're going to dive into some of these. But then my neighbor said, I don't know what any of those things mean, Josh. And I realized the much easier way to say this is there are five postures towards failure. If all systems fail, tell us how you avoid failure. Tell us how you take help avoiding failure. Tell us how you capture and learn from failure. Tell us how you respond quickly to failure. And tell us how you contain and isolate failure. So we're going to show you what we told them for a couple of these. So do you have a published attestation of your secure thing, blah, blah, blah. Now these are corporate sounding words, but basically a lot of them think if I do a pen test from one pen tester, I've done a security program. And all that does is measure your mistakes or identify a subset of your mistakes. 
So we kind of pointed them that even though we used to make fun of Microsoft, they're very over, overtly transparent about what they do. And even if you don't want to follow Microsoft's software development lifecycle, it includes things like paper-based threat modeling before you write a single line of code. It includes things like um, adversary resilience testing. It includes things like system hardening configuration and attack surface reduction and least privilege. And we wanted to show them that that last little mile of do a pen test at the end, you may have thousands of findings, whereas if you have defensible, resilient designs and, and we will help you do them, uh, you may only have dozens of findings. So hopefully this firm knows this kind of a concept and they can make a really weak attestation and maybe their customers won't trust it or they can make a really robust one like we expect maybe someone like Tesla could do and maybe their customers say, hey, if I care about safety, I'm going to go with this gun. Now at the moment, hackability is not the primary driver of car purchases but there was a time when crash testing wasn't either and if you just had a new kid, you want the five star crash rested car, uh, not the three star. And you can't even tell me in the room unless you're from the auto industry what the heck the difference is between a two star, a three star, a four star, or a five star for crash ratings. But the public can make decisions based on their relative symbolic risk level. This one's key for this room, which is the third party collaboration. They are terrified of researchers in part because they get these big surprises and stunt hacks on the news and it puts them into crisis management mode. And other reason is we found out many of them have been extorted. Someone finds a bug, threatens to publish it with full disclosure unless they're given a lot of money. So many of them have had you know, criminal extortion on a regular basis. So they kind of hate researchers. They think all hackers are going to extort them. And for the last year we've been building the trust with empathy to make them see there's lots of types of researchers. Not all of them want glory or money. Some of them want to make the world a safer place. So do you have a published coordinated disclosure policy? And if you know Katie Mazuris, who's now at HackerOne, she, she ran Blue Hat and the, the Blue Hat program and the bug bounties for Microsoft. She also, one of her claims to fame is she helped write the ISO doc. And I can't believe hackers actually like an ISO doc. But this ISO doc, 30111, tells companies how to have a coordinated disclosure policy that promises that if any researcher brings you a bug, you have seven days to acknowledge the receipt of that bug. And it, what we're encouraging these guys to do is adopt at least the minimum bones of this internationally recognized standard on vulnerability disclosure. And if you do this, you're basically saying we will not sue you. And this is the best way I put it. Is it a beware of dog sign or is it a welcome mat? Uh, one of my friends decided to play with his, his own car, bricked it and was afraid to get in legal trouble just because he was trying to tinker with how does his car work. Maybe one of you guys in this room knows that person. I don't know. This one's a really, really hard one but it's a really, really important one. The first two you can get just by making a policy choice. You can say we're going to describe our security program, the no engineering effort required to do that. You just have to have the guts to be transparent to your customers about what you are and are not doing. The second one doesn't require engineering either. In fact, bug crowd and hacker one, um, I skipped that for now just in the sake of getting to the flow. But in there we tell them how to do these things better or worse. And in that we said look, if you have a recognition and reward system it's even better, right? Telling people you won't sue them is step one. If you have a, a recognition reward system, it's even better. And what's even better than that is if you're using a coordinated service like a bug, a bug crowd or a hacker one, then every researcher knows they'll have a consistent interface regardless of car company. And every car company will have a consistent interface regardless of how wild the researcher is. And it works out for both parties that they can actually get bugs sooner. And it also at a minimum this tells your customers that we take your security so seriously that we want to find bugs any way we can and fix them as quickly as possible. The evidence capture is really hard. This is the first one with the, en the engineering required is going to be hard and the standards to get there are going to be really hard. But you cannot complain that no one's hacked your car if there's no proof to capture if there's any ha hacking at all. So just like we have a, a black box in an airplane or in a a train. We have the NTSB internationally studying failures so that any time a plane goes down, we can make sure that those particular conditions never really hurt anybody else. And then we can stop this conjecture of no one's hacking or no one's trying to hack because you'll have evidence across a global basis with a consistent amount of security capture and logging to know if there's reconnaissance being done, experimentation being done, if you see something might be wormable. You'll have concrete data instead of conjecture and belief. Now this one scares the bejesus out of them because previous privacy people have fought this and they should fight it because the original ideas of a black box were tracking the movement and activity of the driver. 
And what we've shown is that's a false coupling. You can do this without being, having any impact on privacy, especially in an international context. Germany and other parts of Europe are way more diligent about privacy than the U.S. is. And since these cars are sold into multiple countries, this has been stuck for 10 years in debate because they thought you could only do a black box if you infringed on civil liberties. So we said, guess what, guys? You can do something just like we have in the, in the server world, in case, and a court admissible evidence that has nothing to do with privacy. Just focus on the integrity and operations of the system and any sort of security relevant events. This one's controversial and uh, I get in fights with some of my best friends in the DEF CON community about this, but security updates. So when something goes wrong, remember star number zero is that all systems fail. Remember we said there's over 100 million lines of code in these vehicles and remember we said there's a dozen remote attack surfaces to reach that vulnerable code. So they will be hacked as we've seen in the last two weeks with Charlie, Chris, with, uh, with Sammy, with the, the, um, the, um, the Tesla guys. These things will be compromised. The question is, what's your best response time? And I was around at a government vehicle thing with six different car makers. And this was last November before they fully trusted us yet. And I said, so guys, we all know there's a remote kill switch vulnerability in most of your makes and models. It's implemented differently but we all know this could happen. My question to you is if you got hacked today and you're on the news tonight, what is your best case minimum response time to be able to fix it? It's just a simple fair question, right? For a good 30 seconds, no one answered. No one wanted to be the first one to admit it. And then one of the automakers from the U.S. said, well, let's just face it, the 2018 models are already done. Now I got a lump on my stomach because I thought it was going to be measured in months. And what he basically admitted in that statement is he can't fix it at all. They know it exists. They're hoping no one well, violates it. And the best chance is 2018. And then someone else said, actually, you know, it's worse because our IT packages are done through about 2020. And unless they're compatible with those 2018 chassis, we, they may not work either. Now this should bother you if the response time is measured in years. So I advocate that while it does add a remote attack surface, it's damn worth it. So whether it's an over-the-air update or a robust update mechanism, we do this on our phones, we do this on our PCs. If you're going to have software that can be hacked and vulnerable, we need a similar OODA loop, we need a similar response time, we need a similar capacity, not just to have a quick response but a comprehensive one. Those USB keys are not going to reach every vehicle. Even the Takata airbags that everyone knew about on the mainstream news don't have a 100% adoption rate. When they tell you repeatedly you need to fix your airbag, there's still a, a portion of the world that doesn't do it. High portions for some of these things, like 30% don't ever do it. So if, if we want to announce that this thing's hackable and then assume that, that hackability has been removed because a patch has been issued, this is a much better way to do so. And if you're from the industrial controls world, there's a really harsh conditioning that we should be using read-only memory and things should not be patchable and they cannot be patched and this adds attack surface complexity. Of course it adds attack surface. We're asserting very strongly it's worth it and necessary because the alternative of a multi-month response time or a really poor uptake is not acceptable. And I would love to debate that because we want to make sure our thinking is sound. And the last one is probably the most important one if you've been watching the GPAC, which is do you have logical and physical isolation between physical, uh, critical systems and non-critical systems? If you're surprised that the infotainment system and the Uconnect could be hacked in the Jeep vehicles, then I don't know why, this must be your first DEF CON perhaps. So that's not surprising. What should be surprising though is why is that able to control the power, the steering, the brakes? The answer is they're on the same wide open CAN bus network as everything else or at least even if they're on plural CAN buses they can all freely talk to each other because there's really poor segmentation and isolation. So I fully expect we're going to have dozens of remote information entertainment system compromises maybe this year. Especially now there's a little blood in the water. Everyone, all the sharks are going to frenzy and circle and everyone's going to do the me too. It's just like Heartbleed, right? If you remember Heartbleed coming out, it had a pretty logo. What, what people didn't see is the, the other 41 in 2014 that didn't have a logo. Once that bug was found, there were 41 other CVEs published against the same code base. So there's going to be a lot more of these hacked. But what we aren't thinking about is if we have the segmentation and isolation, if we do separate critical from non-critical, if we do one-way data flow or no data flow, then we actually, it's just like a submarine. You can have a flood in several compartments and still not sink the boat. 
and the wide open nature of these is the issue. So while the stunt hacking got a lot of attention and while we have a lot of hearts and minds now paying attention, what I was really disappointed is very few of the pieces in the media actually covered the fact that a robust fix to something like this is that future architectures should take great lengths to separate and isolate systems. I don't know if this is uh, universally understood or not. Now one thing we did is um, we don't want to be sycophantic about it but we can't just keep pointing fingers at past failures. We have to be a helping hand for future success. We can't just look at, at offensive techniques. We have to help them with defensive strategies. And we can't keep looking at the current fleet. We have to be making sure the future fleet uh, is making smarter design choices. So for our part what we've tried to do is to, in, a, in contrast to a lot of the really good research from Charlie, from Chris, from Yoshi, from Savage, from the guys that used Nix back in 2009, is what we're trying to do is make sure that we're not just focused on mistakes that have already been made, the spilt milk. And what we saw is in February everybody made fun of BMW because they got hacked. But we wanted to say if you take those five stars we just described, how is this a success story? And we did an analysis. Number one, they got this brought to them by third party researchers and they didn't sue them. They worked with them collaboratively. So while they didn't have a published standard, they embraced the help of third party researchers in a collaborative way. And number two, because they had remote over the air capabilities, they patched every single one of their vehicles before a single adversary or even a single customer knew they were vulnerable. And the push was comprehensive. But here's the best part. Without anyone forcing them to do so, Someone pointed out that their remote over the air update was passed in the clear and that there's no encryption in the comm layer and therefore they were highly vulnerable to a man in the middle or some sort of uh, malicious payload. So they admitted that and recorrected it and tightened their systems. They went in an iterative continuous process. They didn't sue the researchers. They fixed it over the air. They tightened their system design and told others including competitors who now have the opportunity to avoid making that same mistake. So am I saying that I love the fact that they were hackable in a bad way? No. But am I happy that they're on a continuous upward spiral towards getting better and telling the other rest of the industry? Yes. So while it's our nature and I completely appreciate the skill that we bring to things to wake up every day and look for what's wrong with something, one of the reasons we're, we're building trust with Craig Smith, with Open Garages, with us is we're telling them what they're doing right and then we follow it up with how they can do it better. And you think about Microsoft, I don't know how long you guys have been in the industry but I think, feel like it's been way too long for some of us. A lot of my friends most cherished artifact is they have a framed cease and desist letter on their wall over their desk for, from usually Microsoft, sometimes Oracle unless you're Litchfield in which case he has an entire series of them. But they went from hating researchers to you fast forward and they had the Blue Hat conference which was small, private and invite only and then they expanded that and then they added a bug bounty and then they added the Blue Hat prize which is a six figure prize for finding defensive evasion techniques and whatnot. And then they kept playing with it and they would pay more earlier in the bug crowd. So Katie was a large part of why that happened but so were several others. And I call this the mean time to enlightenment. How do they go from cease and desist to a continuous thing where now Microsoft's execs find it to be a critical and necessary part of their SDL and their business value. In fact, there are parts of Microsoft that are fighting to get into the program because they can't actually service every division. You know, Xbox and MSN and all these different things. So the mean time to enlightenment was arguably 15 years and what one of our goals is is we can't just snap our fingers and have the car companies be as enlightened but what we can do is compress the mean time to enlightenment to maybe three years. Because if we get too impatient, we're, they're going to lose our help. So we have to put some pressure on, but we don't want to put so much pressure on that we expect them to go straight from infant, you know, you got to crawl and then walk and then run. We can't expect them to be, you know, Microsoft level in one year, but I'm damn well going to try to do it in three to five. And that's the part we struggle most with is being patiently impatient, right, Craig? All right. <clears throat> Now a huge mistake as well and if you're at all involved in this arena, please help me with this, is the strategies you need to use for the past fleet are going to be very, very different than for the future fleet. In fact, you, we might even need three strategies but what I found is you're so concerned about the cars that have already been built so they want to do a bolt on thing like an IDS or an anomaly detection and there's a whole bunch of third party ones and there's some pretty good stuff, right? They're going to play a role. If you can't change the chassis, you're going to have to use a bolt on thing. I just think that given the, the failure rates of that approach in the enterprise we're for bolt on versus built in, we have to favor built in wherever we can. We have to favor least privilege and segmentation and isolation and tamper evidence and all these other things. 
but they're so focused on the fact that the other cars that are already shipped could be hacked that they're still doing bolt-on for everything. And while you're looking over your shoulder, you're making the same exact mistakes on a go-forward basis. So I've encouraged most of the automakers at least have two programs, one for the cars you've already built and one for the cars you're building, so that we don't just keep doing the Band-Aids forever and have to pick out an antivirus to run on my infotainment system every time I buy a new car. So if you're working with them, make sure they're looking both at the current problem and the future problem. And then the one that really sunk in and hit home, anybody know what this picture is? Say it out loud. It's Deepwater Horizon, that's right. I can't remember how many days it was on the news or weeks. I, I, I used to remember but I haven't had enough sleep this week. But I think the, the last number I heard was like 38 billion and counting in the costs to BP. So this is one of those things where it happens and they can't do anything about it. And to the auto industry, we've told them it doesn't matter which one of you gets attacked, it's going to hurt all of you. And part of the reason is if people lose confidence in their vehicles, it'll have a material impact on their bottom line. But what was even more haunting is one of the Senate staffers uh, on energy, commerce and transportation I said, you know, I'm surprised that you guys are looking into regulation. Usually you wait for something bad to happen and you don't want to screw with the free market. And she said, Josh, let me be really clear. And I want you guys to pay attention to every syllable here. She said, the automotive industry is a double digit part of the US economy. And any loss of faith in modern vehicles will have a material impact on US GDP and could cripple the economy. She said one in nine Americans are employed directly or indirectly by the automotive service industry or parts industry. And this, this could cripple the economy if people lose faith. So they're taking it seriously proactively because they see, I, I think it's like 20% or more of the US economy, all, all things considered. It's insane. So you're, this isn't something that we're just hobbying with. And if you haven't been to the, the, the car hacking village to play with the CAN bus, this is some twisted pair. This is like full broadcast collision domain. This is scary how much faith we're placing on something never designed for security. And if you haven't started playing with it, then you should be reading the Car Hacker's Handbook and you should be taking courses and, and dabbling with the CAN tools that Craig and others are building because it's not that hard once you understand how the system works. And you can bring your passion and talent to something that avoids something like this. Now the last thing is they're all really excited about autonomous vehicles and if you haven't heard about V2V and V2I, I'm not even going to get in the ethics yet even though I'm a philosopher. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is autonomous vehicles or semi-autonomous vehicles aren't 10 years out. They're already driving. If you've been to Menlo Park and you've been around the area, they're already happening. In fact, uh, Volvo, I think it was Volvo or maybe it was Daimler Chrysler just applied for permission to do autonomous tractor trailer shipping car, uh, trucks. And about two weeks ago I saw the article. So there's trials and autonomous vehicles already. But one of the things about vehicle to vehicle talking to each other and making autonomous decisions and vehicle to infrastructure, if you've seen Cesar's research from IOActive where the smart city stuff doesn't even have any authentication, they want low grade technicians not to have to remember any passwords. So they're passing vehicle to infrastructure information completely naked in the clear on purpose. So one of the problems with this is if we can't make a single car secure, one of my idols is Dan Gear, and he's got this security principle. We have very few laws in security, things that are really just objectively true. And one of them is that security is not composable. And the way I put that is if you take a secure thing A and you take another secure thing B and you put them together, you can't assume it's secure. There's seams and there's cracks. So you cannot compose security. But the corollary to that is you can never take an, a secure thing A and combine it with an insecure thing B and expect it to be secure. And for something like V2V to, v to work, you have to trust the integrity of the messages coming from that vehicle. And since none of these vehicles are trustworthy and none of them are tamper evident to know if they are no longer trustworthy, all the fruits and benefits we are going to depend upon will be based on, you know, it's a castle built on the sand, right? There's no foundation here. So I look at it as a prerequisite for V2V to v and V2I to, to work is that we can actually trust the integrity of the individual vehicles participating in it. Not to mention it will be the largest PKI deployment in history and that should scare you right away. Right? Sorry David. I know you can do PKI but you're the only one I've ever met. So. <clears throat> so basically what we try to say is the road ahead is up to you. We can continue to have an adversarial relationship or we can embrace these five things 
to at least give you a foundation. Now, those five things are not a PCI checklist, and it's not the finish line. It's a starting line. I think the way that you put it, Craig, was no one forced you to put yourself on the internet, but the moment you chose to do so, you are responsible for doing these things. So, again, how do you avoid failure, take help avoiding failure, notice and learn from failure, contain and I respond to failure, and contain and isolate failure? I don't think that's unreasonable, and yet, They've told us that they can't do that something like the black box until at least 2020. And none of this will really change until you as a researcher help us build the body of knowledge, but also you as the buyer of cars or as a citizen who can talk to your Congress critters, that you need and want to be able to depend upon this. You should just buy a car because you like how it looks or you like the fuel mileage. You shouldn't have to worry if they've got a 4G, AE, 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspot. In fact, small anecdote, my wife went to buy a new car when I was in DC and the guy was trying to sell her how hard, really hard on the, uh, the 4G LTE and that the kids' iPads would work in the back seat. She says, yeah, I don't think you know who my husband is. I, I'm not, I'm, that's not gonna fly with him. And he goes, oh, you can shut it off. She goes, you know, I'm not a hacker, but I'm pretty sure I can't shut it off. <laughs> and she was right. Um, so, you know, the way I look at this is, of course, they're gonna try to differentiate themselves in the market and in fact, I saw a car commercial whose entire commercial was a bunch of kids in the back seat playing on their iPads and they went in a different car and the iPads didn't work. They go, who wants this car? Let's go back to the other one. And that was the entire car thing. Nothing about features, nothing about fuel economy, nothing about you know, all how it rated in some sort of car and driver analysis. It was all about the Wi-Fi. And here's the thing. This is my kid's 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspot and it can't shut off my brakes. That elective attack surface is insane. Like, I, we're gonna look back at this point in history where we're gonna say, why the hell did we do this? And one of the ways I put it is things like asbestos, right? It was cheap, it was lightweight, it was fire retardant, there was tons of obvious benefits. Everybody could get, couldn't get their hands on asbestos fast enough. And for a long time, we put it into everywhere. But now you guys know that it caused cancer. It killed a whole lot of people. There have been class action lawsuits, billions of dollars, but moreover, those hospitals, those schools, those manufacturing facilities had to get retrofitted, condemned, cleaned up. It was one of the biggest mistakes in infrastructure history. And I think what we're seeing here, I know I'm at DEF CON and I'm going to say the word cyber again. This is our cyber asbestos period, right? We see the obvious benefits of putting Bluetooth and app stores and Facebook and 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspots, but some of that attack surface is elective. And if we want to do something like that, go for it. Just make sure it's segmented and isolated from, the, from the, the telematics and the breaks, or uh, make sure you do the commensurate care to make sure you've done adversary resilience testing, you haven't just paid a pen tester uh, to do so. So that's what we showed them, and uh, I can take questions, or one of the things I was going to do for like the last 10 minutes or so, if there aren't any questions, is the cavalry has been working really closely. In fact, you met with Marky on Friday, but um, we've been working really closely with Congress critters on both sides of the aisle and in both the House and the Senate because we know what they're trying to do. And until they can talk to more researchers or more automakers in a more candid way, they may make really bad decisions. So I thought about telling you what I liked and didn't like about the Markey bill, and there's another House bill coming later that's a little more thoughtful and planful. Um, but even if you don't like government, they're going to pass something and that something will be really bad, sort of bad, pretty okay, or might be really awesome and make sure that you can do the research without threat of criminalization, that you can get safer cars sooner. Uh, and as such, we can talk through some of those things as well. Does anybody have a strong opinion? Any value in this? Do we just want to poke at uh, the flaws in cars or do we actually want to try to help them contain and isolate them. Yes. I'll have to repeat it for the camera, but go ahead. So the, the question for the camera was the car company said we can't fix it for all right, one more time. Oh, double digit percent of the, yeah. So we're, we're in a bad position. So if, we're, if it's 20% of the GDP and they're currently vulnerable and we can't fix them until 2020 at best, how do you resolve these? Well, the answer is we're in a very precarious time in history. And while, I, let me, I'll, no one's asked me to say this, but this is a good time to pull in my analysis of Char what Charlie and Chris have done. 
and I'm trying to be very fair here. Um, and let me, let me put it from the perspective of how Washington saw it. Number one, the research was top notch. Really good stuff. They did a good job on the research. Number two, they told the auto manufacturer discreetly in October. So they gave them advanced notification before coming here. Plenty of advanced notification before coming here. Number three, they shattered a long held excuse used by the automakers, which is if it requires physical, we don't have to do anything about it yet. And while there are several really good things, in fact, that's one thing I should not skip. Um, right away, we, we were introduced to the Society of Automotive Engineers. Right away, we were introduced to the Department of Transportation Volpe Center. Right away, we got involved with DHS and parts of NISTA. So we've found incredibly talented people in every single car company who are doing the right thing, trying to do the right thing, have really good designs for future vehicles. They know that the past vehicles are really scary and they're doing smart things. Now some of their aim was off. They were trying to do something for segmentation and isolation that has never worked for us. But they were doing the right things and I think they deserve mad props and credit for that. But the transition period bef between adding remote connectivity, exploitable stuff, knowing they have and being screwed and being fixed, it, we, we're in this really dangerous point in history because we have lots of remotely exploitable vehicles with lots of ability to, to have physical impact and kinetic impact and we're kind of hoping that no one noticed and that adversaries don't take advantage of it. And that we're in a foot race between fixing these things robustly and having very large consequences of failure. So back to the Charlie analysis, right? If it's great research, they did disclosure without you know full drop in O-Day, and they shattered a long-held excuse that kept some of those car companies, or at least the execs at some of those car companies from taking this really seriously. They thought they had several more years and they don't. They never did. But they shattered that excuse. And by the way, just so I'm precise, this is not the first remote over the air hack. It's just the first one that rose to the level of public consciousness, right? I mean, Savage and Yoshi did it, um, what, 1,300 miles away, if I think, in their white paper. And the UC Snicks guys also did it. But they did it on a test track, and they were academics, and they didn't get the, the, the bombastic sensationalism. But also the public wasn't as aware that cars were computers on wheels. So where I think it went off the rails, and I know it went off the rails for Congress critters, is by doing the test on a highway without consent, without police escort, without a closed loop, and by screaming you are doomed over the, the phone, um, I, I spent most of my day getting screamed at and having the first time I've ever heard F-bombs dropped by Congress critters. Because they're trying desperately to help make sure their peers understand that white hat research is vitally necessary for public safety. And they're trying to help us fight bad laws like DMCA and CFAA and there's a new one that's called ICPA, which none of you have even heard of, which is the International Crime Prevention Act. And there's a, the Wassener stuff, and there's also the executive order from April 1st. These five things are an existential threat to researchers writ large, if they're done wrong. And these guys who have been advocating for a year and a half, with people like Jen Ellis and myself and Trey Ford and Space Road, they said, you're making it impossible for us to help you. When you do stuff like this, and you, you know, you've convinced us that these car companies have a lot of growing up to do, but this stunt convinced us that you do too. So it, while we're getting a lot of the results, we have to make sure we do it in a way that doesn't deploy antibodies. And the truth is we're never gonna be able to control those, the choices of every given researcher, but I hope this group doesn't say this is a success story and the new normal, because it's gonna take that helping hand, not just the pointing finger. And what kills me, and I probably shouldn't say this on camera, but I'm going to, is there were two car companies who were going to announce their coordinated disclosure policies through the cavalry during this week, and they got it canceled because their, their lawyers saw the GPAC and saw the responses, and they're like, see, researchers can't be trusted. So if any one of you ever get sued by one of those two companies because they decided not to do their coordinated disclosure policy, that's one of the collateral pieces of damage from this sensationalism. And third, we actually had a car company who was bringing stuff to do a hackathon at our B-Sides track and had to cancel that too. So those are three concrete setbacks from too much, too extreme a response that scared the more conservative executives at these companies. They're great researchers and great security teams at most of these companies. They're not all the same level of great. But because of that fear factor, um, it at least set us back for six months, maybe longer. And if one of those bad laws passes, if you guys know what CISA is, it's the, it's the Computer Information Sharing Act, or what, um, it's basically the Information Sharing Act in the Senate. It's likely going to pass. 
And somebody, when they saw this video, said, maybe we should squeeze ICPA in, which is the International Crime Prevention Act, which, if it's badly worded, it won't even go to debate. It's just going to pass as an amendment to the CISA thing because they were scared by the, the news about the GPAC. So I don't want fear-based response. We've put a lot of scaffolding in place so that we can have a collaborative approach, a careful approach. You know, it's going to take a little bit of everybody's different talent pool, and I'm really appreciative for the, the fact that they've now changed the dialogue. But we have to make sure we're not scaring people so badly that they come after the researchers, because then we're not going to be safer sooner. Long answer to your question, but I kind of had to get it off my chest. Yeah. Well, one thing that's very, so for the camera, what do you say to people when they say they can't do this for seven years and now that people are scared, how do we do it faster? I think, you know, the tagline we've been saying since our open letter one year ago is we can be safer sooner together. If you didn't see it, the, the fact that there was a recall, here's the good part about the sensationalism because the toothpaste is out of the tube, so let's just make the most of it. That recall sent a message to all the other car companies that if you have a remote exploitable vulnerability, you're, you're going to have to go through a very expensive recall. And they know... They don't know how to measure the cost or ROI of security, but they know the cost of a recall. And they know the cost in, in brand damage as well, which is why I had the deep broader horizon thing. So that changes this and makes it a board level discussion and that might accelerate them making better future choices. Prior to that recall, Craig and I spent time with different executives in Detroit and they said, well, you know, it's gonna be by 2020 before we can do this thing. And we said, no one's forcing you to put the 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspot in. So if you're saying it's gonna take you five years to fix a new attack surface, but you're adding a new attack surface once a year, can you see the problem here? So that kind of conversation was more theoretical until the recall. The second thing I wanna point out, just so I can give some kudos to Billy Rios and some of the cavalry work, what didn't get nearly as much press is the Hospira drug infusion pump that Billy found a remote exploitable fly in. We had been told for years that the FDA can't act on a cyber recall until there's proof of harm, until there's actual evidence that it actually hurt people. And on Friday of last week at 2.30 in the afternoon, they issued the first ever recall for a device with zero proof of harm. And Billy didn't do any testing on a highway. He did testing on devices in his kitchen. There was no one put in danger. There was no sensationalism. And he got a similar effect. And I think trends like, what gives me hope is if the FDA is willing to be proactive and have a financial and monetary impact. This sent a message to every de device manufacturer and medical that if you have these kinds of flaws, it's gonna damage your market share. I mean, Hospira has to pull those from the hospitals and they don't have the replacement unit till December. So you can't use the current model and you can't buy the replacement till December. Guess who's gonna lose a lot of business? And it's not meant to be punitive, but because those two events now have board level attention, that you have to take research seriously, um, this might be the, the, the next stage of this evolution. So we're currently prone. Maybe this forces better collaboration with people who have the empathy to do it as a teammate instead of as a you know, bomb thrower or something. And that gives me a little bit of hope. But no, we're still in that period where um, it's going to be pretty bad for, for a little while. And I, my hope is that you don't see ideological adversaries or criminals taking advantage of this sooner than we can actually do something about it. But if it does come to that, those cars will be pulled from the market. It'll be very costly, but you'll have a much more great, egregious uh, response. All right, I think we got five minutes left. Anybody want to hear anything about the Markey bill or the other one? So I'm not going to tell you all the details, but um, the Senator Markey bill has three security, three privacy things. Um, it did get better. The original draft said, had a line in it that said, uh, any wireless capability must be subjected to a pen test. And I said, okay, uh, why just wireless? You know, there's ODB2, there's USB, there's the app stores, there's a whole bunch of remote attack services, there's progressive dongles. And I said, why a pen test that's a trailing indicator after you've done an insecure design? and they're not very comprehensive. Pe you know, different people find different things. I said, according to which standard, there isn't a pen test standard. By whom, there isn't a certification for pen testers. And what do you do with the residual findings? You can, who's gonna absorb that liability when you have known findings that cannot be fixed in that make a model? So they did, in fact, make that better with some of that feedback, and they did encourage segmentation and isolation. 
but it's still leaving a lot up to be desired. And my fear is that as it's currently worded, it could end up becoming a PCI for cars, which is, would be a terrible, terrible, terrible mistake. Whereas the House Energy and Commerce Committee has put out a letter and they took a lot more briefings from a lot more security researchers, including the five star. And that letter is also public. And I would love to maybe aggregate through a, a project on our Slack channel or something, you know, a professional unified commentary on here's what we like about the Markey bill. Here's where we're concerned. Here's some suggestions and do the same thing for the house letter. Here's what we like about these, these survey questions. Here's where we would like clarification. And we can formally submit an expert commentary on the parts that, are more likely to cause things to be safer sooner and the things that may be a distraction decoy or create a, something that will take five or six years to undo. So if anyone's interested in that, um, we have lots of working groups and we do aggressive uh, work on the Hill, mostly education, we're not lobbyists, we're just educating them. But I would love to put together positions uh, and, and pull more people into the fold because if they can hear a voice of reason and technical literacy from this crowd, it becomes an antidote and a counterpoint to the FUD or the distractions of some of the lobbyists who want to keep things the same way they are. So uh, I got a, little, a late start, but I'm going to make sure that we stay on track for the day. So I'll take as much question or comment as you guys want in the hallway um, and can get you connected with us or with Craig, or you can even start your own open garages in your own city. Um, but I think the talent in this room is going to be making a difference because they have, and this is not a platitude. Just a small handful of us have tangible results in specific car companies who are now adding coordinated disclosure policies or who are hiring security researchers or who have announced, like Ford announced that they're going to have a uh, over-the-air update system. They were at hell no when we met them. And now they've realized that not only is it going to make them safer, but over-the-air updates is way cheaper than recalls and it's way less stigma than recalls. So it was actually their finance guys that finally understood why to do it, not so much their cyber guys. But this kind of approach is having concrete tangible results and just go talk to the Tesla guys at how awesome they were. They spent, they had their entire engineering team in our B-Sides track all day on Tuesday and are highly engaged. Not only do they have a coordinated disclosure policy and a bug bounty of 1,000 per bug, they just took it 10X up to a $10,000 so far and they're just getting warmed up. So they're at stage three of their coordinated disclosure policy and we can make fun of how little it was at first or we can encourage it and then you can crawl, walk and run. But there's quite a few uh, bright spots, and I think the more help we get from more of you, the more likely we'll be safer sooner. So thank you.